Welcome everyone to, to tonight's guest speaker, Warren Brown. He is going to be presenting on Cake Love, Find Your Passion, Find Your Calling. I would just like to thank the sponsors of this event that helped make this possible. That includes the Black Graduate Student Association, Cake Club, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Culinary Science Club, Entrepreneur Club, Food Science and Human Nutrition, Multicultural Student Programming Advisory Community, Papa John Center for Entrepreneurship, and the Committee of Lectures. As a big thanks, let's give our sponsors a round of applause. Also, after the lecture, I invite all of you to stay for the cake and the book signing. Hope you enjoy the lecture. Warren Brown is more than just a pastry genius. He is also a father, husband, and a wildly successful entrepreneur. Mr. Brown began his professional career as a health educator in 1993. He later went on to attend law school, and he graduated in 1998 from George Washington University with a Juris Doctor degree and a master's degree in public health. He later went on to become a healthcare lawyer for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It wasn't until 1999 that Mr. Brown began to discover his passion for baking. At the start of his at the start of the year, he made a unique resolution to expand his culinary knowledge and learn how to bake. By 2002, Mr. Brown had left his law career path far behind and opened Cake Love, his first bakery. Since then, Cake Love has expanded to include six retail stores throughout the Washington, D.C. area. From 2005 to 2007, Mr. Brown hosted the Food Network show Sugar Rush. He has also authored a few cookbooks, which you can buy over there, including Cake Love in the Morning and United Cakes of America. Mr. Brown has been recognized for his entrepreneurial spirit by many national media sources, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Today Show, CNN, and NPR. In 2006, he was named the Small Business Person of the Year by the Small Business Administration. Another involvement of Mr. Brown's includes his work with Kid Power DC, a nonprofit organization that conducts after school programs for DC youth. In his free time, Mr. Brown likes to speak to students and rising entrepreneurs about finding one's passion, the main reason he is with us tonight. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Warren Brown. Good evening. Actually, I'm just going to go with uh, this mic since we have. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I actually already feel warmer <laughs> now that I'm up here. I, I was just going through the, um, someone asked me if I had the jitters. And I said, no, I had the shivers because uh, I'm a little colder. Coming from Washington, DC, um, I don't know why, because I am used to cold temperatures. Yesterday was 24 degrees when I was doing my daily deliveries uh, on Sunday morning, which I do as, as an entrepreneur and owning my own business. And I was out in the cold weather. And um, so I should be used to it, but uh, I'm still warming up. Uh, I wanted to speak to you guys today about my business and about how I came to uh, this point in where I am in my career uh, and in my life because I want to share with you guys what I go through uh, on a regular basis uh, every day in running Cake Club and also some of the things that I went through and worked through in order to get to where I am in this point in my life. Uh, and when I say work through, uh, it really is uh, about getting to be familiar with where you are in life, making decisions about where you want to go in life, and uh, figuring out how to get there. And a lot of what uh, I've experienced, I think, is um, I, I hope to be valuable. And I really want to share that, um, those lessons so that uh, people can benefit from it, um, people can understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur, what it's like to have a food business, what it's like to just be in business uh, and balance all the different things that go with it. Uh, raising a family, uh, having a good time, and having some sense of satisfaction 
that uh, can make it a little easier to sleep at night, if you will. Um, so thanks again for the invitation and for allowing me to share my story because I really do actually like to talk about not just cake and entrepreneurship but recipes as well. And I had a really nice time this afternoon doing that and um, I look forward to kind of sharing more of that uh, in the questions and answers that we'll have after uh, my remarks. Um, so cake love. Cake Love is the bakery that I founded in Washington, and it opened up just, um, just about 11 years ago. March 30th, 2002 was our first day of business. And it was a Saturday, and um, I was very excited. I had a very small staff of about five to six people. We had cupcakes, pound cakes, layer cakes, and uh, a lot of the recipes that we used back then are what we do today, but uh, things have changed and evolved over time. And my business acumen has changed and evolved over time. And when I started Cake Love, I was, I guess, uh, standing at the beginning of a, a dream fulfilled. And standing there thinking to myself, I've done it. You know, I've actually I've opened the shop. And I can remember bringing friends over to it and showing them, not showing off, but just wanting them to be part of this experience that I had and wanting them to, to see and to feel, you know, what it means to have a concrete plan fulfilled. And that's a lot of fun. It's, it's a nice sensation. It's a great experience to, to see that dream fulfilled. I wish that for everybody. Uh, how I got there uh, is definitely uh, something that is, I think, on the road for many of you uh, who are interested in going to business for yourself. And um, it's, it's about understanding what your passion is and I guess either uncovering or unlocking what that is. For me, my path to my passion started when I came out of uh, law school and started working as an attorney. And you know, you could wish that uh, the job that you take after school, whether it's college or graduate school, is exactly what you want to do in life, and hopefully it is. Uh, but if it's not, then um, you know, you'll be like me. Going to work uh, as an attorney, cover carrying my briefcase and getting there to work, sitting down at my desk, and turning on the computer and realizing, I don't really want to be here. You know, I don't want to be doing this. I have to look at all these cases, and here's my file, and you know, here's everything in my drawer, and I'll work through it, but I kind of feel like I'm going through the motions. I go over to my boss's office and talk about the cases and the log and all the activity, and what's happening, where are we going to settle, and I found myself saying, why are we spending all of our time talking about a case where, you know, the settlement offer from the opposing counsel is $5,000 and they want to push it up to $6,500. Like my boss wants to fight over 1500 bucks for a case that was five years old or a fact pattern that we're never going to take to trial. You know, I said, I think I can create something that's a little bit more meaningful than just the dickering over the amount of money that's a at issue for settlement. I want to make something that's three-dimensional. I want to make something I, I'm proud of. I want to create and contribute in a way that uh, I'm not seeing right now, make a product that's unique. So I had a New Year's resolution, and that New Year's resolution was two parts, one of which we saw up here and was what became my mantra. Direct yourself to greatness and answer your call, an answer to yourself. And for me, I knew that I wanted to. Let me just turn this off. Sorry, I think we're getting feedback. I knew that I wanted to um, make something different out of who I was and where I was going. You know, when I was in high school, uh, the coach used to say, okay, well, you're taking a foul shot. You gotta see the ball into the hoop, okay? And so I have to see where I want to go with my life. And that's me directing myself to the great place of where I wanna be. 
And what I knew is that I, I didn't know that I wanted to go into baking, but I knew that I just had to get out of where I was with my job as an attorney to be creative. And answering my calls, for me, you know, it's funny, at that time, I was fresh out of law school um, in Washington, D.C., a person who's first year attorney, uh, doesn't really have a lot of clout in the city. You know, there's a whole sea of attorneys there, so you just don't have a lot of standing, essentially. And I, I just didn't feel very proud of who I was. And I wasn't going out and just meeting and mixing it up with a lot of people. Friends of mine from law school had all left town, so I just felt alone, really. And I was avoiding seeing people, meeting people, and doing things. But I needed to get out there literally answer the telephone if it was ringing. I needed to answer the calls also just from inside of me to tell me like what to do, to be more outgoing about things, to just kind of seize life and follow it and pursue it. And in answering to myself, I knew that I had to take some risks. I would have to take risks in order to kind of fulfill this greatness dream and vision that I might have that I could see myself doing. And this is all in the abstract, so it was kind of hard to wrap my hands around. But where it came, where it began to become concrete is uh, a second part of the New Year's resolution, which was to just learn how to bake. It was a very simple kind of, uh, you know, idea. But I've cooked since I was a kid, and I love everything culinary. Passion for food since I was like 10. Barbecue sauce is the first recipe I can remember making on the, on the stove for ribs that we uh, made out in the grill in the backyard of my house. Uh, I've made Mexican food for my dad, you know, for the whole family, but my dad loved burritos and guacamole, so I learned how to do that, taught myself that. I remember making marinara sauce uh, in high school. I invited this uh, one girl over for um, lunch <laughs> that I uh, really wanted to date. And she said, sure, I'll come over. And the last minute she flaked out. And you know, I've always kind of had something in me about marinara sauce and how special it is, <laughs> even though uh, she didn't come over. You know, I mean, for me, like food is, is very meaningful. And it's always been something in some place that I go to in order to express who I am, in order to just uh, have not a diversion from life, but a diversion from boredom and just mediocre things. My mom cooked all the time when I was a kid, and I liked what she made, but it wasn't creative. You know, it was this 1980s. Uh, I'm 42, so I was like in 1985, I was in eighth grade, and that's kind of the time when like my hunger just began to it just explode in terms of like I'm always looking for something to eat, and the 80s was the time of bird's eye and green giant, frozen vegetables, kind of boring stuff. We never had any fresh garlic in our house. Never saw an eggplant in my house. Zucchini, not at all. You know, it was kind of like frozen block of spinach, pour some water over it and let it melt. Not exactly the most interesting foods. Uh, but it got the job done. I grew up to be a really tall, healthy kid. <laughs> um, but my, uh, my interest in all things culinary really started back then. But I didn't know how to bake anything. Didn't have any interest in baking, not cookies, not cake. Didn't really have a sweet tooth when I was growing up. Uh, and so, you know, in 1999, going out to parties, I'm kind of listening to myself, answering my calls, going out and trying to mix it up, meet people. Um, I don't know how to have a conversation about cakes or baking or anything that has to do with anything sweet. So I said, you know, if you really are interested in food and you want to kind of come off as somewhat educated about it, you need to round out your experience. You need to learn how to bake, Warren. So that was a resolution, 99. And I started out with this book called How to Bake. And I worked on blueberry muffins and got that down. I was like, these are really good. Moved on to pies, and tarts, and cookies, and cakes. And uh, I was, you know, looking at all kinds of different places for recipes, magazines, books, talking to people, beginning to look on the web um, for recipes, because that was the beginning of the internet era when Netscape was the main search engine, <laughs> very long time ago. And um, 
I finally stumbled on this one book called Art of the Cake. And I found it up in New York City, uh, one of the Barnes and Nobles or something like that, bookstores, and I just fell in love. This beautiful chocolate cake on the cover and wonderful pictures, but more importantly, just fabulous recipes with wonderful head notes. Something I never really even paid attention to in a book, the head notes. I was reading them, I was enter entertained, and I was just engrossed at the detail level. And then the ingredients that were used were different. The book was basically like French, uh, French gateaus, right? Um, so layer cakes, but using buttercreams that were different, and cake you know, like recipes, Genoise cakes, totally different, and combining them in ways I'd never seen done before. And they sounded delicious. They looked delicious, and they tasted delicious. So when I got back to DC after going to New York, I'm going through and working through this cookbook, and I'm beginning to understand that I'm getting it. I am cracking the code of how to bake a cake from scratch without having to follow a recipe. And I'm beginning to really enjoy it. And I'm past this point where I'm hesitant about, you know, if I can just kind of go off script. And I made my first cake that was my own. It was a sour cream based pound cake with brandy, vanilla, rum, amaretto, Seagram 7, a <laughs> little bit of uh, lemoncello. And I took a lemon, an orange, and a grapefruit. And I took the segments of each fruit out, put them in a pot, sugar to cover, bring to simmer, strain out the liquid, put the fruit in the sour cream mix with all that alcohol. And I'm telling you, like, this citron bunt is what I called it. Was, it was the most interesting cake I've made, I, I think, that I've ever made in my life. Um, and I've done it again. I've replicated it. It's even one of the cookbooks. And I loved it, you know? I just loved it. And I brought it to work, and I put it in the kitchen, and I left the kitchen. I was just like, <laughs> what are people going to think? It was so, so curious. And um, they just loved it. They, they ate it up. And I was so proud. I was so happy. You know, I was like, finally. I'm creating something that's interesting, that's novel, different, and I'm listening to the cues that are inside of me of, here's how you do what you want to do. Can't tell you how good that feels, guys. You know, the following, you know, you know, your heart about something, and to make it and see it and be able to point to it and share it, that was awesome, and it still is. I mean, that's satisfaction. I get that all the time when I make something new, different, or even the same recipe, but just goes well. And so the citron bunt, um, it's always been one of my favorite cakes, and. After I made that and got the feedback, I realized that I'm onto something that I want to continue with. Don't know where it's going to lead, but I'm just going to follow this and see where it goes. So I went crazy. I made a commitment and decision, okay, you know what, Friday nights, we're baking. We're baking and we're just going to experiment and see what's going on. And every time you come home from work, Warren, <clears throat> you crack an egg, you're in there for three hours. No questions asked. All right, because if you don't spend three hours in the kitchen, you're not actually getting any work out of it. And you're going to figure it all out so that you can, you know, you have something on the counter that you're working on, something that's in the oven, something's cooling, and something's next. You know, just keep going, go through this. This is the Warren Brown Culinary School. <laughs> and, um, and I really enjoyed working through it. And I tried all kinds of things. I was in search of the most moist chocolate cake so I could solve that chocolate cake problem. And, I don't know how many recipes I tried, but my whole freezer was full of cake. And my fridge had nothing but cake ingredients in it. It actually became a problem because I, um, I didn't really have anything to eat, you know, like regular food. And so I found myself, um, I don't know, just up late at night, 11, 11, 15 or so, and I would be wrapping up, uh, cleaning my kitchen, and realizing that I hadn't really eaten dinner um, over and over again kind of thing. Uh, you know, my, my passion and my quest for cooking, it got me into a little bit of trouble. Um, one, one evening, one night rather, I woke up in the middle of the night, used the bathroom, and I'm just kind of not, not feeling myself, kind of feeling hot, flustered or something. And uh, 
I get back in bed, but it's not working out. So I, I go to my kitchen. There's a door to a deck off the kitchen. And I open it up, and I get some fresh air. And it's like 50 degrees or so. This is April or so. And um, I don't feel good. I'm having trouble breathing, I think. I'm having trouble standing up. I'm feeling weak. And I sit down on the ground, and I lie down on the ground, and I'm lying down flat on the kitchen floor, and I still need to get lower. That's like my body was telling me, get lower to the ground. So my dad um, uh, was a pathologist, and uh, he lived in Cleveland, Ohio. I was in D.C. at the time. I called him up. And I said, Dad, something's wrong. I, I don't feel good. I, I don't know what it is. And he's like, well, you should call 911. And I didn't want to do that. I thought that was a little extreme. Like, what's the big deal? Surely I'm OK. I'm only 30 years old, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I say, OK, well, I'll do something. I called my neighbor who lived right downstairs, Karen. We were good friends. And she came up. It's 2.45 in the morning. So she comes upstairs, I think she had a key, and um, she finds me on the floor. She's like, Warren, ah. <laughs> she, she drives me to GW Hospital about 10 minutes away. Doctors in the ER, um, they send, send me in, EKG, temperature, blood pressure, everything like that. And the doctor says, all right, Mr. Brown, you know, you're fine. You're just, uh, you're tired. You're doing too much. You gotta, you gotta slow down here, man. You're only, what is it? He said, like you're just not, you're basically just running yourself ragged. You know, you're working too many hours, and you need to slow down. So I said to myself, "Wow, I'm having an episode of exhaustion." And I thought that was only things that like people in Hollywood had when they were needed a code word for something else that was wrong in their life and needed a timeout, but. Uh, I was, and I felt that way, exhausted. And it got to this point where like, I had to eat better. I had to slow down. I couldn't come home from work and spend three hours in the kitchen baking uh, and then get up the next morning and you know, go to work as an attorney. I needed to get more rest. So the, uh, the decision was beginning to be forced on me as to what I would do, leave law or and bake cakes, or just kind of keep baking as a hobby that was really just a small pastime. And uh, I, I really was torn. And I spent a, a while trying to figure it out, talking to friends, talking to my family, uh, trying to figure out uh, which direction to go in. And there are a couple things that kind of helped me decide, and some were more moments of difficulty where I uh, kind of faced my own reality. But I think the nagging thing in the background was always that I wanted to avoid a midlife crisis I felt like I could predict. You know, I felt like I could see myself as an attorney practicing for years, maybe staying at the same job, or like probably going someplace else, but just never really being happy. I looked around at my friends who were attorneys, and they were all complaining about the law. Everyone wanted to do something differently, uh, different. This was in about 2000 or so, so the dot-com bubble hadn't really popped, and we were all talking jokingly about one love website that we all wanted to start, leavingthelaw.com. <laughs> and the idea of pursuing a dream that was not related to, you know, working behind a desk and filing papers away it was very much alive. It was alive in me, and it was alive in everyone else I knew. So I, uh, I began this uh, kind of commitment to the idea of let's, let's look into how I start a business. And for me, um, it, was, uh, it was a challenge that, uh, it was a challenge just to understand like what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? You know, how do you understand and how do you, how do you start a business what do you need to know to start a business? I mean, all this time when I was making cakes and f having fun with the recipes, it was just for fun. It wasn't with the idea that I'll start a cake business. Even if it was, it was just, I'll make some cakes on the side for the weekends, maybe a wedding cake here and there. But now I was thinking about opening up a retail shop or 
finding restaurants that want to buy my cakes and finding other somebody else to make it and just kind of keeping myself as a lawyer and having a side business as a cake. I, I didn't really understand what I could do exactly. And if I do leave law together and make cakes, is it for contract baking, retail shop, just cakes, full line bakery, you know, what's it gonna be? A lot of things for me to figure out. And I think that uh, to be, um, yeah, just, just to be fair, it's like I was just kind of following opportunity as it was presenting itself. One of the things I knew that I needed to do though was get out of my job um, as an attorney because time and commitment just didn't allow for both. And so I kind of structured it so that I had a leave of absence for my job, uh, leave without pay, three or four months. And my boss said, you know, we love for you to succeed. If it doesn't work out, you can come back. Don't know what job you'll have when you come back, but you'll have one as an attorney and you know, that'll be great. So I said, okay, I can take that. I'll take it and run with it. And I knew when I took the job or I took the leave that I probably won't be coming back because I'll be spending like $10,000 on food equipment and how am I going to pay that off? And you know, really, how is my ego going to rest with that? How am I going to leave one thing and um, you know, dibble dabble and baking and then come back to law? It just didn't seem like I'd be able to make the transition uh, out and then come back in. So I, I knew that in October of 2000, when I left Health and Human Services, that I wouldn't be coming back, but I didn't quite know where I'd be going. Um, on, the, uh, on the second day of my leave of absence, I had a really interesting experience where I was uh, following up on uh, a client that I had brought some cakes to a couple, like a week or two before. And it was at this food supply shop called La Cuisine. It's in Washington, D.C., just across the river in Virginia. They bought three different cakes, one of which I think we have here later on today, coconut vanilla, coconut chocolate cake. And uh, the cake I brought, I was a little worried about because when I delivered it, it was very warm. And the buttercream can get a little unstable when it's warm. So I go over to La Cuisine after shopping at Trader Joe's and I was a little hesitant to go in, uh, but there was a parking spot right out front. So I said, okay, well, I guess I gotta park my truck and I'll walk in and you know, there were no, sa uh, there were no um, customers that I could see. So the sales staff were readily accessible and I was talking to them, chatting them up, talking to Nancy, talking to Fernet. You know, how was the cake? Did you like it? Oh, Warren, you know, we really liked it. It was very good. It was you know, really tasty, unusual, uh, but there was one problem is that they all kind of slid apart. And I was like, oh no, that's terrible. You know, like I, I made it with buttercream and I just wanted to make it you know, really rich and pure. And Fernette says, well, you know, sometimes I use a little bit of Crisco just for fudge room because it's not as, um, you know, it's not as vulnerable to the temperatures and it won't slide and melt. And I said, yeah, I don't want to do that though because buttercream is something that needs to be really pure and the vegetable shortening won't taste good. And so I want to you know, really be 100% you know, authentic about my recipes. And this woman was standing there that I hadn't noticed during all this banter. And she says, well, what kind of cakes do you make? And I said, oh, you know, cakes with fruit, pound cakes, cakes with chocolate. And I wasn't really sure what she was talking about or going for because she had a lot of stuff in her basket and this is October, you know, in anticipation of Thanksgiving, okay, but she had like three or four different types of roasting pans and equipment for turkeys, a vertical roaster and a horizontal one and lots of thermometers and like so much stuff that it didn't make any sense, you know? It seemed like she was a confused shopper in some way. <laughs> so I was like, well, I don't know how much attention I want to pay to this person. A lot of people asking you like, oh, what kind of business are you in? So I just gave it a kind of standard reply. And she said, well, if you ever want to bring in samples, then here's my card. And I look at her card and it says, Judy Weinrob, Washington Post food writer. And I'm like, hey, I've got a story for you. I'm this guy who's sitting on the fence about like, you know, leaving law or opening up my own cake shop. I'd love to bring you samples. Can I? You know? And um, so she said, okay, honey, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, just give me a call. Give me a call. I called her up. 
and brought in samples like the next week, brought in like five whole cakes. I thought that she wanted, I mean, when someone said samples, I didn't know they meant just give me a slice of each one. So here I am with five cakes that I bring in, a tall stack and stuff like that. Um, and she, they tasted them after I left and gave them the spiel about what I'm doing. And they said, well, you know, we're really intrigued and we want to follow your story. We want to follow you for like three months to see what happens with this leave of absence that you're doing to find out if you'll continue to make cakes and open up a shop. And I said, that's great. I'd love that. But don't you want to do a story right now? You know, it's in anticipation of holiday season, like maybe get a little coverage, something to help boost sales. Because again, I mean, I left law, you know, I, I meet this woman like a couple days later. I didn't have a really, I didn't have a business plan figured out. I didn't really have an idea exactly what I was going to do. I just had this like burning passion to bake cakes. And um, she said, we want to follow you. So my business plan of sorts became to um, basically uh, write a business plan, uh, make sure I'm just working the media angle, and uh, just develop my recipes as best that I could. And in writing this business plan, I was working on everything from going to community banks to talk to them about an SBA guaranteed loan to trying to figure out a marketing angle to understanding how to hire people and train them and what I look for. Uh, how do I kind of set up my computer system for paying bills? I mean, all this stuff. Now, I found that the best way that I learned was from listening to other entrepreneurs, other business owners to find out what they were going through. Their personal stories really is what kind of made me feel eh, not at ease, but um, more comfortable with the gray area that was in front of me when I would go into business. And that gray area would never become more defined. That's the one thing I found, and I continue to find that to this day. Um, their coverage of my experience from lawyer to baker uh, resulted, it, it came out as this full page article, huge picture, will Warren Brown leave law to bake cakes? It was published on March 7th of 2001. I mean, I still remember it to this day, of course, because like my phone didn't stop ringing for three days and it changed, changed my life. It introduced me to the culinary scene in Washington, D.C on the front page of the food section of the Washington Post. It was the biggest picture in the newspaper that day. And my friend, like Sarah, she called me that morning at like 7.45 and she's walking or like waiting on the Metro platform. She's like, Warren, do you understand how large like this article is? Like, I, I can't believe it. Like, this is unbelievable. I hadn't seen it yet that day. And I didn't get a chance to go to the market to pick up an edition of the paper until like 12 noon or so because the phone was ringing constantly. And that media coverage is what propelled my business. And I just continue to try to work the media angle, work the media angle, you know, go for that free publicity. And it worked beautifully because it brought me the lease for the first storefront that I had. It brought me lots of volunteers to, that ended up actually working at the bakery brought me volunteers to help fill orders that came in because of that. The orders kept me going in terms of business and cash flow. Um, it felt good, of course, to like have that kind of exposure and it felt like my decision was sound enough, but I still was, you know, how am I actually gonna put it all together? Um, did the article actually help me get financing? Um, it didn't hurt certainly didn't hurt, but it didn't lock it in either. I still had about four or five months of, am I gonna get financing you know, in front of me? And uh, once I did, then I could put it into place for a store. But all of this I thought would happen, you know, opening up a storefront, I thought I could do that in three or four months. Uh, anyone else that's out here and that's been in business knows that uh, I was as naive as they come. To think that I could open up a storefront from you know having no business plan to you know in three or four months it took like 18 months or so before I was in business and in a retail storefront so I, I learned a ton and it's all because I really followed this I think kind of like intuition to follow up on that customer 
to see how those cakes that I thought slid turned out. And you know, and the, the bit of a disaster problem of cake sliding and not working out turned into this whole thing with Judy Weinraub, Washington Post, major coverage, and all that coverage just led to more coverage that you know ultimately led to what I kind of consider like the top of the food chain for media, which is being on Oprah Winfrey's show. And, and that was another level of like just massive exposure that just brought in more sales. And all of it, um, all of it really was because I followed this idea that was in my heart that I wanted to just pursue a passion and an interest in, in cooking and baking. And, you know, that interest to this day continues, and I think it really fuels a lot of what I'm doing, and it gives me the energy to get out of bed at 3.45 in the morning when I need to go test recipes and experiment and try something new. Um, because that's when the kitchen's most free, and, you know, I can bake without people interrupting, and my kids are still asleep so I can get home before they wake up. Um, you know, working in a business that uh, somehow, like, just interests you in your heart is, I think, the way to go. Can't promise that it's going to bring you the monetary rewards that uh, maybe some other things would, but it doesn't necessarily all come down to that in life. And, um, you know, however people learn it is uh, how they do. For me, that, that's one of the things that's important for me. Uh, it's important that a business makes money so they can continue and makes profits so that it makes some of the work worthwhile. But um, it doesn't always come down to just what it is the dollars. You know, sometimes it comes down to other things that are of more value, I think. So, um, you know, the, the experience has been uh, a good one. And is it rocky? Sure. Some people ask me, like, do I get scared or am I scared? Was I ever scared? Hell yeah. You know? You can't be running a business. You can't be, you can't be alive and not be scared. You know? When the heck are we ever not scared in our life? There's always something that's in front of us that's, like, going to be terrifying and make you tremble. For me, you know, those things come down to sometimes it's like, are we going to make payroll? You know, are we going to make rent? Um, did this person get hurt on the job? Uh, is there, you know, is there some kind of vulnerability that we have? You know, I mean, like, I, we, we deal with all kinds of different, uh, like, risks. And we try, and I try as much as I can, they definitely to mitigate any kind of risk from happening. But, uh, but they do. I'm just thinking about my mind stuck on, um, I had two shops, a, a bakery and a cafe right across the street from it. And we would bake product at the bakery and put it in a cart and push it across the street in the crosswalk. But of course, you know, with cell phones and people distracted driving, crazy Washington D.C. drivers like on the most important person in the world get out of my way. Um, somebody ran into the push cart uh, that was being pushed by one of my employees and knocked him to the ground. Uh, the employee lived, thank God, and was banged up, but not too severely. Uh, but you know, that freaked me out. So what do we do? So okay, so we put all kinds of emblazoned things on the card, uh, make sure that uh, you know it's um, easier to see. I think we actually even got a shorter one so that they could see over it. And uh, lo and behold, next year, same thing. Different person hit again, distracted driver. So finally, the city paid attention a little bit and they changed the way the sequencing of the lights were, and you know, no one else got hurt after that. But uh, you know, risks happen, you know, bad things happen in the course of running a business, and it's unfortunate, but uh, you know, we try to make sure that uh, everyone is safe. But those are the things that kind of scare me. They worry me, they give me anxiety. And um, I truly wish it wasn't there, but that's what happens with running a business. And uh, it doesn't take away from the, you know, the value and reward I get out of following a passion, but you know, that, payoff part of like following my passion that's a small percentage of the work that goes into running the business and I don't regret that but um, it's still only like 10 to 15 percent of what I get out of every day so I people definitely keep that in mind because um, in running a business uh, you get consumed with other things and you have to pay attention to those other parts of the business 
uh, in order to make the whole enterprise work. Um, I guess the only thing that I kind of want to, you know, just add about the business itself is that um, what I've learned about it and about myself is, uh, I, I guess, a bit of a process. And it's nothing like super duper remarkable. But um, I enjoy the process that I have to go through in looking at what we're doing. And it's a bit about like, well, how does an entrepreneur think? You know, we were talking about this at dinner. And for me, it's about you got to assess the situation. You have to take ownership of that situation. And you got to work to improve it. And, it, and everyone that, that I encounter that works with me, like that's what I want out of them. Some people say, what's the ideal employee or, or what do you want? What skills do you want in an employee? I want that. I want someone that can come in, and, you know, see what's going on, take the time, take stock of what's happening, figure out, you know, where the problems are and, and somehow take that ownership over it. You know, like, please, National Harbor, okay? The heat left on at night in the past month. You know, and the bill went from $800 to $1,100. Someone left the heat on in the front section of the store overnight for the whole month, basically, because the, we just shouldn't have a spike like that. And so, like, I want the person that's closing, the two people that are closing, I want them to make sure they're just taking a step and turn the heat off, please, you know? And I need them to not say, like, oh, I forgot, or, oh, I didn't know you wanted me to do that, or, oh, I didn't know how to operate that machine. You know, I can't anticipate every single thing that's going to need attention. You know, there's a store and everything within it has to operate and function. Please, just kind of put your thinking cap on. Lights are on, turn them off. Take some ownership over it. That's all I'm asking for. Work to improve everything that's there. Work to improve yourself. This one person's making cake. She was making um, Nutella filled cupcakes. Chocolate cupcakes, scoop out the, the cake in the middle and then fill with Nutella and go for it. So you got a lot of like cake that's scooped out. So I go back to her after seeing the cake that was scooped out and it's no longer there. It's like, where's, where's the cake? She's like, oh, I threw it out. So what? Cake pops. We make cake pops, don't we? She's like, yeah. Well, what do you, use the cake for the cake pops. She's like, oh, I didn't think of that. I'm like, would you please? You gotta be thinking all the time. You know, don't just say like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna, gonna go through things. So that's, that's the ownership part. I just want people to take a little bit of ownership. There's a resource here that's like cake, and can I do anything with it? Nah, you know, I don't know. Maybe I should ask somebody. Maybe I should just think about what else I got to do next. And it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's tough. It's not easy. You know what I mean? Cake Love is as good as each employee. Each employee is as good as their training. Sure, you know, we train, train. Yeah, we do. Do we all of us have time to train perfectly? No, you know? But like, you know, every business is as good as the last, of the first and the last employee that's working there. Um, but what I really want out of each employee, because I'm not a micromanager, and because I don't want to be one, is I want people to just take that ownership step. Um, it helps a lot. It helps a lot, I think, for the team, the whole organization, all the people that are in it. And I think it helps for the individual's advancement. Not just in, uh, at the job, but I think it, in life, you know? That's a big part of being a um, critical employee. It's a big part of being a team player. And it's uh, just a big part of being a good person, you know. Um, so uh, I don't want to end on like total like note like that. Um, but uh, we will take questions, I will take questions in a second. Um, let me just get a show of hands from people and we're venturing into territory I don't usually get because there's not so many food science people, but how many people bake? Awesome, awesome. Okay, so how many people when you're baking use a scale? Okay, so like, that's a lot of hands actually that went up. Uh, relative, usually when I'm doing a speech like this, like I'll get one, two, maybe three hands. Probably saw like 15 hands go up. And it's like, that's just a, that's great, that's great. I encourage everyone to use a scale, especially when you're measuring flour, because you scoop and level, as many, many of the most instructions tell you for measuring flour. 
like the flour just packs into that cup measure. So to me, there's a lot more flour in that cup measure with scoop and level than you actually want to bring into the recipe. And um, you know, for equivalency, what kind of flour, how much does that weigh, go to Google. Just Google for how much it's going to weigh. Um, my world, five ounces of all-purpose flour equals one cup. But in my world, I no longer use only all-purpose flour in my cakes. And I was talking about this uh, earlier, about how my recipes have um, changed a lot or evolved, I should say, uh, over time, and particularly like since December or so, because we have, I have done a lot of um, soul searching and looking at what we're doing and trying to make texture uh, a little gentler, finer, and trying to make the whole cake less dense or less compact. And in doing so, looking at folding in some cake flour together with all-purpose flour uh, and taking out some ingredients. So it's just been, it's been a fun ride, but um, the whole thing of using the scale, I encourage people when they're baking at home, look into getting a scale. Uh, simple digital one, 30 bucks or so online or at a, like a food supply shop. It'll help to really give you a lighter texture in your cake because you won't have as much flour as if you're doing the uh, scoop and level method. Just give that one a shot. Um, so, you know, for me, again, like following my passion has been really, really nice. Uh, I've found to be soul satisfying, uh, much more so than practicing law was. And what I like about it is that I'm able to, um, I guess, basically look at my children, my two daughters, and feel like I'm doing the right thing for them. Uh, it's anxiety producing because it's all resting on my shoulders whether or not the business works and I want it to work for them for lots of different reasons of course but um, it's very nice when they say that daddy makes cupcakes <laughs> and uh, and you know how much that means to me is uh, I can't even express it because because um, they're they're just really the light of my life and um, you know if I was still practicing law would I be happy Probably, but I'd probably be kind of pouring my life into things other than just law. Whereas in making cakes, like, I'm very happy doing that. I'm very happy in my professional kind of constant search for more and better recipes and different ingredients. And uh, the other time I spend outside of it, it's really just for, you know, swimming and all that kind of stuff. But I find the work a lot more satisfying than I I know that I ever would with uh, practicing law. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer at the microphone that's in the center. Are there any questions? OK, go ahead. Why cake? You, you had all these other things that you tried baking. What was it about cake that uh, was the thing that drew you? Um, why, not, why not why pie? Not sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> cake spoke to me because um, I thought of this bakery when I was a kid, uh, Laximadel Bakery, that uh, they used to make this uh, we called it a chocolate ho-ho cake. It was basically just a very large ho-ho. And um, I hadn't had it in years. And when I tasted buttercream, homemade Italian meringue buttercream, uh, it's like I remembered that. And I remembered the, just the, the taste sensation and how much I liked it. Uh, so it kind of turned me on that way, it brought me back to being that time when I was a kid. But also, like, cake's a very good product to make. Um, and it's perfect for a setting in terms of like, I was in my apartment and I needed to bring something that I wanted to sell to people. So they needed it for birthdays, they needed it for weddings. Uh, I can make it and put it in a box, bring it in the box, bring it to them room temperature. It didn't have to be refrigerated as I transported it, so that was perfect. Um, didn't have to like kind of like heat and reserve or you know, heat it to serve up or anything like that. So it was very, it was very transportable. Um, product that was in demand that I also could figure out a lot of different uh, ways to make it better. And then it also just kind of reminded me of um, 
in terms of all the meticulous work you have to do with cake making, I mean, it's a lot like other baking, but when assembling a cake, I like that because it reminded me of the assembling model airplanes and toy soldiers and stuff that I used to do as a kid. And like the steps are similar, a lot of meticulous work, but it's the, it's the craftsmanship and the mindset that I had to get into to do that work in terms of making my own formulas for my own recipes. That, I like that solo independent work and uh, I just found it very, very enjoyable. Hi, Warren. Thank you for sharing your inspiring story. I am an entrepreneur myself, and I am very interested in the portion of your story where you say that you got this, uh, you met this woman, mm -hmm. um, and you got her card, and yeah. she was the writer from the food section of the Washington Post. Uh -huh. So um, what would be your advice for entrepreneurs to get to that uh, opportunity? to get in a big newspaper. Mm -hmm. Because how would your story be different mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you didn't meet that person? So mm -hmm. um, uh, from my experience, I got uh, an interview in, in a newspaper in my country, mm -hmm. but it was because of my network. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how other entrepreneurs can get into that, um, into that opportunity? Sure, no, it's a great question. and. Um, I think that uh, the key thing is, I talked to a friend of mine when I was starting out, and before I met the woman from the Washington Post, and Malcolm was in the uh, news world and press world, he's a reporter, and I said to him, well, how do I get on Oprah here? Like, how do I you know, get in the news media? And he's like, we can't just like write Oprah, okay? You have to start local and grow it that way. Because he said to me, like, news feeds on news, and it's really literally like, small fish eaten by the bigger fish, eaten by the biggest fish, eaten by the sharks. And, um, you know, my recommendation to anyone who's starting out that's looking for press, looking for media, is to really go to the, the, your smallest local kind of source and feel very comfortable and very, um, feel very good about starting there. Don't feel like um, a smaller newspaper or any kind of blog or any kind of smaller media is not worth it because what you really need is just to be in print, whether it's digital print or real ink print, and, uh, and have something that, is, that records you and talks about you so that other people can see it, and in this world, so other people can comment on it and like it and tweet it and feed into it. And that whole building of your record and reputation starts with any kind of local small media outlet. And that's, that's really what helped feed uh, my business. It just so happened that the, the local paper that I was in was, was a big one. But um, that was just, that was luck too. I think it's really, really important to just start local and start small. And if you have to, create press events for yourself. Like I made a, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think I had any press there, but I've done other events like that, even including this past weekend, where we have a little press event uh, which is essentially a tasting. I had a cake uh, open house when I first started, but this past weekend we had a cake uh, cream cheese icing tasting. And uh, the whole point was to bring in customers to see what they think about it, get some comments and feedback. But in the meantime, we're also gonna provide some bloggers, a reporter from the local uh, AOL patch, like a very local version of AOL, and just have them do a little story on it. And that hopefully will lead to other press and other coverage and talk on people just commenting about what we're doing right now. And um, those things also just kind of help build momentum, get uh, just everyday people talking about it, getting a little buzz out there. And it, it's amazing to me, it's like how much that actually feeds into the growth of the business. Definitely you gotta keep the long view uh, because it will take a while before the comments will begin to kind of come back to you. Uh, that that's okay, I mean, hopefully you have a nice long runway for your own business and what you're looking to do, but um, you gotta give it time and you have to be patient because it, it is something in building a business that um, doesn't happen overnight and you gotta just be willing to make that commitment that what you're doing now, you're not trying to reap the rewards of it 
this quarter, next quarter, maybe not till next year. Any other questions? Right here. Do you think your daughters are going to take over your business? <laughs> um, I, uh, if, if they want to, I hope that uh, they'll be able to. Um, I mean, uh, when I say hope they'll be able to, one, I hope that we're still, still there. Uh, and two, I hope that um, it'll be something that they would want to do. I won't force it on them for sure. I was just talking to someone, though, about this that, um, you know, my, my dad was a doctor, like I was saying, and my mom raised us. She didn't work. So the family business would have been medicine, I suppose. Uh, I didn't go into that, obviously. And my dad really actually wasn't very encouraging because he saw the writing on the wall back in the 80s that it wasn't really going to be a, as promising of a career as, uh, as it once was. And um, I like the idea of a family business, or I like the idea that a fam of some kind of family coherency in what the business is uh, of the family. And so if my daughters are interested in something like this, food service, uh, that'd be great. Um, but I, you know, I was raised to kind of believe that uh, you should be very well versed in lots of different things and very much understand, like, the fundamentals, I suppose, and pursue what your pursue what interests you, and that's that's one of the reasons why I'm doing food. Is my mom was very much encouraging of to do what you like and to do what you want to do. So I, I want I'll support them in that way. All right, um, I think we'll take one more question or a couple more. So I have a question about the timeline of when you decided it was time for you to take that risk. Um, sure. And were you single at the time? Because obviously if you're... Yeah. No, I was. Yeah, I wasn't married. And um, yeah, I was single. Okay. Without the commitments, without having the risk, and without, uh, without having to worry about other people. So I, I knew that that's one of the things that, one of the reasons why I should make this leap at that time. You know, I mean, I was 29, 30 years old. And uh, if I waited, I knew that I wouldn't be able to have that kind of flexibility. So uh, it said to me, like, you know, if I don't do this now, when am I going to do it? Because I need to take advantage of the time that's here and don't get too far down the line with practicing law because you might not even want to leave. It might just be too difficult to, to get out. You know, I, I once read this article, um, I think when I was in law school, talking about a an attorney who had left law to pursue a passion for music and the guy um, practiced for two years and there was some reference in the article where it, it made it sound like two years was a solid amount of time to give it a shot. If it's not working out, it's kind of okay to exit. I don't know if I just filed that away for whatever reason, but uh, I said, okay, well, I kind of need to do this at least for two years and then, then I can begin to kind of look for an exit out of it. Uh, but I mean, honestly, I knew after the fourth month that I was going to be leaving there because I was, I felt like I was working harder than, I mean, this is kind of wrong to say, but I felt like I was working harder than other people or like at least like my interest to work hard was more than what I was seeing from other people. And um, I mean, this is, I don't know how messed up this might sound, but when I was there, I was expecting that I'd be working like till nine o'clock at night, you know, like every night. And people were gone by 5, 5.30. You know, I mean, it was just crickets at 6 o'clock. And, like, that's fine. It's actually a really nice way to live, for sure. But at the time, that age, I was prepared for much more. And so when I didn't have that, I, I was wanting for more. And that, that's part of what it was. I just I wanted to work harder. All right, last question right here. Okay, so as an aspiring entrepreneur, they encourage you to find mentors. So I was just curious who your mentor was and why you chose them. Yeah, um, mentors, mentorship is something that I've um, not struggled with, but haven't been as good as, at as um, I probably could have. Um, I looked for lots of different people to, who understood what I wanted to do. I didn't find that a lot. Back in 2000, the, the cake market was very underdeveloped. There was no cupcake broader market. You know, right now it's a very developed market with 
lots of examples so that people could understand, okay, you want to open a cupcake shop, I get it, I've seen that before. Back then, you want to open a cake shop, people just thought bakery, they thought full line bakery, breads, everything. I was like, no, no, I want to focus on cake. And so then it was like, okay, well, I've seen cake at like Walmart or Costco or something. It's like sheet cakes that are not the style I wanted to do, not the ingredients I wanted to do. So I found it tough to find people who could put together in their head like the concept I wanted to do. I probably didn't look hard enough. Um, but I also didn't have a lot of time to look that hard. I listened to and, and found lots of different um, uh, books that I read, uh, bi bi biographies about other people in business, and I found that to be a good source of inspiration and answers for some of the things I was looking for as to how to build a business and how to kind of cobble together different things and skill sets I needed. Um, you know. I have been a solo entrepreneur since I started and financed by a bank, so it's all debt financing, it's not angel investing or anything like that, it's not family, friends, and that's got its pluses in one respect that there's independence uh, and I'm not tied to other people, but it has drawbacks in that there's fewer people that you have to kind of regularly answer to, so all the decisions when they're being made, ultimately they just kind of come down to me. And I like that in some respects, but I also would love more people to bounce all the ideas off of and more people, I guess, to kind of be accountable to so that um, I can see a bit of a broader picture in making decisions. Um, so, you know, I didn't have that mentorship group uh, in the beginning. I've got more of that now, but it's very, it's not formal. It's not formalized and I'm, working to get to that point where there's more of that round table who I go to and uh, get the feedback from on a regular basis. All right, thank you very much. Um, we invite all of you to stay for um, cake and refreshments over there and we will have a book signing, but I think we owe him one more round of applause as a thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.